Hello, I'm Alex Lightman, and this is the Lightman Report. Our topic today is time stamping past, present, and future. I promise you, it's going to be more interesting than it might sound at first if you're not familiar with time stamping. Time stamping makes it real. Here we go. So, what's a time stamp? A time stamp is a sequence of characters or encoded information identifying when a certain event occurred, usually giving the date and time of day, sometimes accurate to a small fraction of a second. The past, we had public notaries. The early, earliest predecessors of modern notaries were in ancient Greece and Rome, where notary functions were dispersed among different officials. The notaries, who were called scribe, kept a register for documents from private contracts to international conventions. And this may be surprising to most people, but yes, they had shared stock companies back in ancient Rome uh, 2,000 years ago. So we also used registered mail. Registered mail documents when a particular piece of mail, regardless of its content, was posted from a sender to the recipient. And 1556 marks the first documented use of registered mail. It was during the reign of Mary Tudor of England. Robert Hooke and Isaac Newton timestamped some results in 1660 and 1677, respectively, before publishing them by communicating anagrams to independent third parties. There was, a, there was a big competition between Newton and Leibniz, for instance, over who invented calculus. And so sometimes you wanted to be the first to do it. Newton was, uh, later became the head of the Royal Mint in England and set the basis for gold and created a, the, the British pound sterling as the standard unit for global trade as a reserve currency for 350 years. So it's not surprising that he was an early proponent of an user, an alpha user of time stamping. I like that story quite a lot. In the past, we also have newspapers. We all know the old detective stories where clandestine information was exchanged through classified ads in newspapers. And a newspaper, a newspaper can be used both as proof that a particular piece of information existed before publication time and as a commitment or proof of posting. Another crime-related use of newspaper time stamping was done by taking photographs of an abducted person holding today's newspaper. This was used to prove that the photograph was not backdated. It's often come, sometimes called proof of life. And you also have notary and paper documents. The way to store time stamping and notary documentation has changed, but the basic principles, it's still based on trust and a person who validates the event. Verified and authenticated, we see that and a person is going and saying, yep, I verified this. You see the, all these signatures from a people. And, but we're going to change that. Now we get to the present era. In 1995, Matthew Richardson and his IT Consultancy Limited started the PGP uh, Digital Time Stamping Service, which is still operational and still in use today. And in 2000, the LOCKS system, lots of copies, keep stuff safe, was started, which uses libraries as a large-scale distributed repository of electronic books, introducing independence and, and redundancy as an additional trust measure. Origin Stamp is a trusted time stamping service for digital content. It's used to create a blockchain-based time stamp that's stored by thousands of computers distributed around the globe. How does it work? You create a digital fingerprint of data on your own computer. The fingerprint representative of your data is transmitted to them. They embed the secure fingerprint of your data on a public blockchain. The certificate of the resulting timestamp is returned to you. And there's their service. You can timestamp your documents. You can do location-based expiration. And basically, you can do contracts, document accidents, the time of day, when did this happen. And this could help a lot in a very litigious society to keep track of things. You also want to know who was the first to file. Uh, when did you were the first to file a patent and so on so what and in, but in other places it's first to invent and so you may want to have time stamps on your journals because in a court case over who invented something you may actually beat it uh, in the case of one of the greatest enterprises of all time AT&T uh, the inventor was 30 minutes ahead of his competitor in getting the patent filed for telephone service 
for telephony. And you have online timestamping services, a website where users can log in and upload files that they want timestamped. After a file is uploaded, the timestamping service automatically calculates the hash value of the file. The hash value is computed with a cryptographic algorithm, and the result is what can be described as a digital fingerprint of the file's contents. The, cash val the hash value can be used to uniquely identify the file and prove the file has not been tampered with after the hash value was calculated. And blockchain is the next stage in this whole thing of basically looking at timestamping and cryptography development. And it was implemented first for validating financial transactions, and it's ready to change all kinds of business processes. That's a, a small sampling of all the business processes that are being changed by blockchain. We've gone over this before in a, in a previous Lightman report, so I won't dwell on it now. Timestamping is now being used on diplomas. So five colleges and universities in my former home state of New Mexico, I used to live in Santa Fe, incorporated digital diplomas into their issuing systems, including Northern New Mexico College, Santa Fe College, where I've done a couple talks, Mesa Lands, and uh, San Juan College, and the Ayurvedic. And the Republic of Georgia, which is a country formerly part of the Soviet Union, and Bitfury use the Bitcoin blockchain for land titles. So basically starts off, the citizen initiates his request via a service uh, all or mobile application. The front end part may stay the same as an existing software. There's no big changes. The blockchain executes contracts specific to requested action. The back end side calls the blockchain API and gets a verification response. The re operation result along with its history is always available and cryptographically proved. And public blockchain stores system snapshot hashes to prevent possible collusion. A big part of government is making sure that land disputes and title disputes don't happen. We have title insurance. So a system that could make it even better to say who owns what can result in saving a lot of time wasting and money wasting uh, disputes. And then we also have the possibility of fixing fake news and online fraud with blockchain timestamps. So 86% of people have fallen for fake news at least once. It's even happened with press releases going out that have affected millions of dollars of stock. So people put out bad news after they've shorted a stock and then the bad news goes out and before it can be repaired, uh, before things can be corrected, the person has gotten their money out of the short sale and out, is out of the market. So WordProof blockchain ecosystem is working on solving this problem. They work with multi-signature timestamps. And I'll make a prediction by 2025, if you don't timestamp your articles on the blockchain, you're going to be considered a fraud. Roof, uh, and your articles and so on. WordProof is going to solve the SEO problems with changing the date and duplicating the content. This was a big thing at the hearings that were recently held by the antitrust committee about taking someone's content and then repackaging it as your own as Google has been known to do. And this simplifies copyright. Our Europe chain is dedicated to GDPR compliance for European blockchain businesses. And it's basically supposedly easy. You select the blockchain of choice and push the data on the chain to the content of choice in WordPress. And it's secure. The integrity of content and ownership is secured using the blockchain. So benefits of this, according to WordProof, are it's user friendly, takes two minutes to set up, automatic, you don't need a wallet, the, uses the blockchain, there are no fees, it's fast, environmentally friendly. There have been 226,000 timestamps and 90 million page views, and it's open source and a mo uh, an automated service. And the basic idea is to copyright your content on the blockchain. The WordProof timestamp authenticates the integrity of content on WordPress using a plugin that uh, timestamps to a blockchain. And you remember, there are only four kinds of intellectual property. There are copyrights, there are trademarks, there are patents, and there are trade secrets. And of these, by far the most common is the copyrighted material. And I recently uh, heard an interesting talk by Sebastian van der Lans, and there was a FinTech, uh, FinWise conference recently that I was a speaker at, and uh, th this talk today, this Lightman Report is inspired by that talk. So they're working, uh, Sebastian and his, his colleagues are working on ISO standardization and uh, self-sovereign identity and decentralized identifiers built around timestamps. So, this is one of the biggest projects going on right now in government technology. It's happening in China. So China has announced a 15-year blueprint as part of their country's global technology push. They want to set the global standards for 
for things including Bitcoin. And so according to this blueprint, 140 government service applications are on the blockchain going into three categories, data sharing and exchange, business collaborative processing, and electronic certificate and certificate storage. So one sector for blockchain-based use cases includes real estate. This is what I've seen most of the government uses of blockchain that have, are getting enthusiasm. Um, and they want to do that with 11 units, the Municipal Planning Self-Commissioning Committee, Housing and Urban Rural Development, Taxation Bureau, Public Security, Market Supervision uh, Bureau, Civil Affairs, Banking, and Insurance Supervision, amongst others. So if you're one of the Chinese viewers of the Lightman Report, China is a, is a leader in government implementation of this. Well done. And we also have Digital Notary and Blockchain Proof of Existence. Proof of existence is the ability to certify existence at the foundation of notarizing. And the document itself can be saved in the blockchain in two steps, hashing the document and direct replacement of uploading the certified document in the blockchain. It's more practical to upload the hash copy of the certified document. It's also costly to have numerous documents stored on the blockchain and data privacy, such as uh, with GDPR, has to be taken into consideration. And storage on the blockchain, the hash value is recorded on the blockchain. And there's an image of the notarization certificate with the name, the date, uh, data and time, and the signee. And then you also have digital notary uh, document ownership transfer. So in cases where transfer of ownership is required, the ownership of such a document is determined either through an external user account or a certificate authority system. And the ownership database is maintained on the stored data on the bounded blocks of the blockchain. And transferring ownership is as simple as changing any record. The user identification is recorded in related areas of the transaction is used for verification. The signature is created for the user in the data field through transaction identification verification. The blockchain provides hash verification and signature storage during the contract deployment. And then we have uh, SSI and verifiable credentials. So we've talked about self-sovereign identity in a previous Lightman report. Please refer to that if you're interested in the topic. Blockchain is implemented into Org Book BC as a searchable public directory of open verifiable data about organizations legally registered in the Canadian province of British Columbia, which is my favorite province. The system consists of more than 2 million verifiable credentials about companies, organizations, and their licenses. And this infrastructure is based on sovereign identity and decentralized data storage. All the data has cryptography confirmation is controlled by its owners. And they, if you want to get any position in government in Canada, you now have to take place through the creation of a competency profile using verifiable credentials. So in, in this system in Canada, there are 1.3 million active legal entities. It holds the cred credentials for 2.4 million uh, people and organizations. And they added 2,769 the week before I did this. So here's a way that this whole all thing works. So an applicant creates a profile and then starts the application. They, the applicant claims skills via work experience, community work, education, personnel. The application is assessed. The assessment stage references uh, another stage. The verifiable assessment record is issued. You add to the profile digital wallet, and then you apply for the new job using verifiable assessment records to substantiate the skill. So imagine a workplace where everybody's skills could be certified, and it could all be on the blockchain. And as you add credentials, you put them on the blockchain. So you can't have somebody suddenly claiming to have 20 new skills you know, being able to, to do sushi with puffer fish and everything else suddenly without having any work experience to show. And uh, the sponsor of this Lightman Report, DNA Chain, provides basis for self-sovereign identity um, or sovereign identity implementation. The DNA Chain is an open source public blockchain creating a decentralized ecosystem of digitized assets and entities uh, with the blockchain as a service it provides enterprises and individuals access to customize, convenient, and secure blockchain services. And here's a, a graphic I like quite a lot about Metaverse, the development route of the blockchain. So starting off with digital currency and digital notarization, going to digital assets, digital asset exchange, working on avatars, and then their oracles, which is different. This is basically their um, own oracle.
a source of truth, and then going to smart contracts, and then ending up with software for decentralized autonomous organizations. And finally, uh, SSI and digital avatars in the DNA platform. Essentially, a self-sovereign identity is one in which each user retains full control over every aspect of their personal data and how it's controlled or shared. Creating sovereign identities via digital avatars is one of the most effective solutions for digital identification of a person's events and deals. And DNA builds the identity or the avatar at the core of its design. And having self-sovereign identity at the core of a public chain is essential for wider use due to the needs to build a reputation score, to perform know your customer and anti-money laundering, complying with regulations, to have a token economy model based on ownership of data and assets, and protecting user privacy. So in sum, uh, self-sovereign identity decentralization is the future. Uh, Self-sovereign identity products are implemented globally and are going to involve hundreds of millions of users without the need for them to learn new technologies or change their behavior. And the idea is to go through just recapitulating the whole process of this time stamping idea is paper-based identity, then going to a traditional digital identity model, to an identity provider model, to a self-sovereign identity model. That's where we're going. So I hope you've enjoyed this romp through history and the role of time stamping in history. And perhaps it'll help you to make a unicorn. Uh, thank you for watching.